Hello to all of the subscribers of the Global Energy Association. Today we will speak to Professor Omar Yagi, who is the founding director of Berkeley Global Science Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, with whom we continue our series of chats with shortlist candidates of the Global Energy Prize 2021. Professor Yagi pioneered a new field of chemistry through his discovery of metal organic frameworks. It changed the way we use materials and their ultra high porosity led to storing voluminous amounts of hydrogen and methane for transportation. Professor Yagi, it is very nice to have you here today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. So hydrogen, methane, carbon dioxide and water are four of the smallest known molecules and they have the highest impact on transition to clean energy worldwide. So you have been addressing this challenge over the last 25 years. How will your research help modern energy transfer then? Thank you. Um, yeah, we uh, in the mid 1990s, we discovered a way of linking molecular building blocks together uh, through strong bonds organic and inorganic to make porous materials, extended structures. And one can vary both the inorganic component and the organic component so that these materials uh, could have a range of porosities. Uh, porosity, controlling the pore size, controlling the internal surface area, and also controlling the chemistry of the pores. And so what this has allowed us to do, uh, because the building blocks are linked by strong bonds, is to make durable materials that can operate day after day, month after month, year after year in a power plant to trap carbon dioxide. Or if they're using natural gas, let's say for fueling automobiles, you can store natural gas into the pores of these materials at levels that you cannot do without uh, the uh, metal organic frameworks that, uh, that you have uh, mentioned in your, in your introduction. So the key feature of these is not just a strong bond that leads to durability, but also we showed that in fact, the pores can remain open and therefore things can move in and out with great ease. And another important feature is that since we can design them on the molecular level, we can make them extremely porous, what's called ultra high porosity. To give you an idea what that is, is uh, for example, in one gram of material, which is no more than about a, a coin, size of a coin, uh, you have a surface area of 7,000 meters squared per gram. Okay, now for, for anybody that's listening to this, uh, if they're not in porous materials, they may not appreciate what this number means, but I, an easy way to communicate uh, what an ultra high porosity material like this is, is that in that one gram of material, if I was to unravel it on the molecular level, I would cover at least two football fields. Okay. That's or, impressive. And, and, and so, so that's the, let's call it the footage onto which one can store gases. And because we can go in and design the adsorptive sites for methane, carbon dioxide, and so on, these small gases that you mentioned, um, we can compact them next to each other without having to use very high pressure or low temperature. So, in a tank filled with moth, in a fuel tank filled with moth, we can store three or four times, even four times, the amount of natural gas that a tank that doesn't have moth would. And so this allows the automobile, let's say, to travel three to four times the distance without having to refuel. Without changing the volume of the fuel tank and without changing the practical conditions under that, what that fuel tank operates on. So, and that's because the moth acts to compact those gases within its pores because those pores were designed chemically to attract that particular gas molecule and stack it up in the pores to give ultra high uh, uptake or storage capacity. 
you almost answered my next question, but uh, so you, you said it is possible to create such um, like framework within which uh, certain gases can be stored with double or even triple the amount of it, but can it be used to increase the storage capacities for like any other agents? Uh, certainly, for example, that same analogy, if you apply it to CO2, you can store 25 times the amount of carbon dioxide in a moth that you would in a tank that doesn't have moth. But furthermore, let's say for carbon capture, not only can you store the carbon dioxide, but also to begin with, you can separate it from the different other gases that might be present in flue gas or in the air even in small amounts of carbon dioxide that exists in the air, although small amounts, but they're harmful, they need to be separated. So you can go in and design uh, chemically uh, modified sites covalently using strong bonds to attract and with groups that are specific to attract the carbon dioxide out of the air or out of fuel gas so that you're not taking up other gases such as nitrogen, which we don't need to take up. And to avoid also complications, let's say that water may present in terms of competition with carbon dioxide for those adsorptive sites. So we modify the pores chemically so that the moth material can seek out just carbon dioxide, pluck it out of that gas mixture and store it into the pores. Now in future, and we are working on this already, uh, we want to be able to not just store it in the pore, but also convert it to a, a starting material like a, um, a fuel, so that not only are we capturing the carbon dioxide, but we're using it as a fuel, and so uh, or as a way to create valuable valuable chemicals. So that it's not just a material that is stored under the ground. <clears throat> So a significant part of your work has also been aimed at harvesting water from low humidity air, for example, in deserts. And uh, in the light of our efforts to explore Mars, can this help us find water there? And is there a limit to the amount of water that can be extracted from the air? Very good question. In that application, because we demonstrated how you can trap water from desert atmosphere where you only have 10 grams of water per cubic meter, so it's a very low amount of water in the atmosphere. Um, we also can design these materials to, to have adsorptive sites where we can extract water from very low concentration. But the key, I think, important advance here is that because of the organic and inorganic component of the moth, one can modulate how tightly that water molecule is bound to the pore. So not only can you take it in, but you also don't need a lot of energy to take it out. That's why harvesting water from desert air has been very successful using moths, uh, because, uh, because you don't have to apply a lot of energy to remove the carbon, the, um, the water. And so um, this is an important feature of what I call reticular chemistry. It's not only can you assemble the materials using covalent bonds, using, using strong bonds, but also you can modify them on the molecular and atomic level, sometimes atom by atom, uh, so that they can be suitable to carry out very difficult separations, such as what you mentioned, such as water from air, and as we have done and demonstrated, such as carbon dioxide, from air and such as storage of natural gas to give us hopefully clean air, clean water and clean energy. Yes, and as I understand, this is directly related to the concept of energy water food nexus because this installation that harvests water is powered by PV as I know. And uh, it turns out that by putting one in the desert you can provide a remote village, for example, in Africa not only with food, but also with energy. Is that correct? Exactly. So, so the idea is that the moth, because it doesn't hold onto the water too tightly, it's selective to water, but it doesn't hold onto it too tightly. You can use just ambient sunlight to remove the water. So 
in principle, you could have a device. In the example that you just showed, you could have a device that operates at night to take up the water from air and during the day because of the change in temperature and the heating from the sun, it can be, it, the water can be released and harvested into a drinkable uh, water. So now another uh, aspect of this is that if there is electric available, then you could always power the device from a solar panel or by other means so that now you can carry out more than one cycle. And now you're, the productivity that you have would be um, dramatically improved. So we have published uh, results that show that in fact, up to 40 liters of water per kilogram of moth per day could be produced in this way in some of the driest regions of the world. And again, I keep coming back to the strong bond because without the strong bond, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this. You wouldn't be able to make these robust frameworks that operate uh, extensively and over a long period of time. Uh, these MOFs have been tested 30,000 cycles already um, and they are still operating. And the MOF can stay in the device for the lifetime of the device for five, six years. So it's, it's very exciting. And the energy requirements for this process can, can be, can be uh, supplied by sunlight, ambient sunlight, or by a, 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 solar, a solar panel, depending on what kind of productivity you would like to, to achieve. Thank you. And in the end of our short talk, I would like to once again return to the question of CO2 and its capture. Um, what would you what would be the best way to use CO2 further after it is captured? Because I heard it can be used in catalysis, for example. Well, um, you know, right now we use um, processes uh, you, um, that 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 uh, that that yield carbon monoxide, which is an excellent starting materials for many chemicals. Well, we've already demonstrated that that you could convert the CO2 captured in the moth. In this case, it's not a moth, but a covalent organic framework, which this is another class of porous materials that we invented in 2005 for two-dimensional structures and 2007 for three-dimensional structures. But they are also porous, but they're all organic and made of covalent bond, entirely of covalent bonds. Now we've shown in that example that you can trap carbon dioxide and convert it to carbon monoxide, which is a valuable uh, starting chemical. But potentially, you could, you could convert uh, carbon dioxide to methanol. And we've shown preliminary evidence that this is, this is possible. You could take methane and convert it to, to methanol as well. Because you can go into the moth and in this case, do, in the last case I mentioned, do what enzymes like methane monooxygenase to take methane and convert to methanol, except now you're doing it in a moth that has been functionalized with copper centers that are suitable for this, uh, for this transformation. So I would say not only can we do CO, but potentially you can make hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon fuels, and Hopefully down the road, perhaps we can make important organic molecules like pharmaceuticals uh, using this uh, using this this method from CO2. So thank you very much for this informative interview. I wish you all the luck in your future projects. And so today with us was the Professor Omar Yagi from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you very much and take care. Thank you.